So what I do after butchering out a rabbit is I'll take it and I'll put it in the fridge in a bit of salt water and I'll let it sit for a few days until the rigor kind of comes out of it. And then if I'm going to freeze it, I'll freeze it at that point. But if I'm not going to freeze it and I'm going to eat it, I will put it in some kind of acidic marinade, such as a white, uh, white wine vinegar or some Italian dressing or pineapple juice or something along those lines to help break down the meat further so that it retains its moisture as it's cooking. Some people have suggested buttermilk. I don't necessarily like buttermilk with my rabbit. On chicken, though, it's really good. But yes, I highly suggest resting your meat for a couple of days before you've put it into a, the freezer. It really helps the experience when it comes to eating rabbit. Do I advise crossbreeding? It depends what you're planning. If you're just planning on doing meat rabbits, I've heard great things about crossbreed vigor, especially with crossing Californians and New Zealand whites. With that being said, there are some downsides to crossbreeding. If you're like me and you take your rabbits to show and you're crossbreeding, you're taking up space in your barn for your show rabbits. Even your show rabbits that are meat breeds, like these guys. So if you're showing or looking to keep pure lines, I don't suggest crossbreeding. Outline your goals and what you want to do in your barn and decide if crossbreeding is right for you. But in my program, it isn't right for us. So here I have two blue-eyed whites out of the same litter. We have a regular-sized baby right here, and beside them we have the runt. So what is my preferred method of dealing with a runt when it comes to giving them extra feedings? So I'll take mom out of her hutch, and I'll place the runt on her, and I'll allow the runt to find a nipple on their own and eat and fill their belly up so that they can get enough nutrients without the rest of their siblings kind of pushing them around. I prefer to supplement nursing this way when I can, just to ensure that the runt is getting food. This takes less time, is easier than bottle feeding, and ensures that the runt is getting all of the nutrients off of mom's milk. I do have a video on how to make baby bunny milk further back in my videos, but this is how I actually prefer to do it if given the chance. You don't have to do any of this. That's just what I prefer in my breeding program. So let's talk about these comments, and specifically I'm talking about the very end where it says, sorry, but I work in the veterinary industry, so I know what I'm talking about. That section right there, let's talk about it. Unless you can drop your education and what college you went to, the year, and all of that good stuff, I don't believe you. Sorry, I just don't. Because anyone can say that. I can say I'm a one-eyed, one-horned, flying, purple people leader. Doesn't make it true. But do you know what does make it true? reliable sources, like the ones I use on a daily basis and I freely quote in a lot of my videos. Texas AMU, Ohio State University, Michigan State Agricultural Center, the ARBA. The sources that I cite are real sources, but not only that, they follow the rules that you should have been taught when it comes to your education. Make sure they're within 10 years. Make sure it's a reliable author source with an educational background in the study that you are quoting. Third-party unbiased funding and third-party peer review. If you're going to quote something, make sure it makes sense. But because of that, I'm extremely anal in looking up studies and making sure I know what I'm doing when it comes to my animals. So if I'm wrong, prove it. I love a good debate. And as some of you know, I will debate with you in the comments all day long with sources. But unless you have that background, you have those resources, and you have those studies, you're spewing BS. Emotion is not a source. Emotion is not a study. The way you feel does not dictate how people need to raise their rabbits. With that being said, pet people, I'm not telling you how to raise your rabbits. Heck, I ain't telling AG people how to raise their rabbits. I ain't telling farmers. I'm telling you how I raise my rabbits. My preferred methods and my research-based methods from people who know a hell of a lot more than I do. I'm more of a time saver. So what can I say? If you don't agree with my methods, that's fine. But if you're gonna tell me I'm wrong and tell me I need to change my ways, you better be able to prove it. So before I get into this, I wanna say I don't hate Flemish. 
I have a Flemish. His name is Zumi. He's like freaking 15 pounds. He is a big boy. He's not one of my meat rabbits though. He's one of our pets. So my opinion on Flemish is that they don't make good meat rabbits. And that's because by the time you were to butcher them out the same age as a Californian between eight and 12 weeks, they don't have the best bone to meat ratio. At that age, they're mostly bone. Great for stews, great for stocks, great for all that, just not great for meat when you're comparing it to Californians and New Zealand whites. With that being said, Zumi, who is my little Flemish cross monster over there, has an amazing temperament. Great for pets, great for showing as long as they're willing to feed and handle a rabbit that gets as big as some dogs. Just not my cup of tea for meat. So yesterday I decided to film some of my posing practice and I decided that maybe I could do a little series introducing everyone to all of my show rabbits. Now if you're going to do posing practice, don't be an idiot like me. Get yourself something soft like a towel so your bunny's back legs don't scoot out from underneath them, making them look flat. Anyway, this is Strawberry. He is currently our main breeding buck. He is a mini Rex and he is a very handsome boy. He's been doing really well for us at show. The only problem is I cannot call him my show bunny because he is my daughter's show bunny, a fact she reminds me of constantly. So he goes to all of our youth classes for her and he's done really well. We're using him as our main breeding buck right now because he has an amazing shoulder. For those of you who don't know, some of my shoulders are a bit long in the barn. This angle is horrible but we're using him right now because he has some amazing type and fur quality and he's just a good boy. This might take a second, but I got you. This is Pickle Rick. He is my four-year-old military macaw mixed with blue and gold. This is Samantha. She's a three-year-old cockatoo. She's the newest on the property and we're still trying to figure her out. This is Panda. He's my good old boy. He's like 10. I got him while I was working at a tax store when I was 15. This is Kiwi. She's our one-year-old husky. This literally butt doesn't hold still very well, but this is Thor. He is my one-year-old Swedish Wilhelm. Sheldon the inbred barn cat is five. Opal the Louisiana trash kitty is three. Our old fat girl Sandy has been 13 now for three years. Zumi, the rescue man who started all of the pet questions, is five or six, I think? I gotta look at my paperwork. He a big boy. Queen Cardi is six. This is Gigi, my daughter's lilac otter buck. He's a year old and was out of my litter of bottle babies last year. When he's getting his free range time, he likes to hide under my daughter's bed. Maximilian, also known as Max or Maxipad, is three or four now, and he likes to get out constantly and sleep at the front door. This is Dallas. She's a four-year-old. She's my three-day eventing prospect. Ask me how that's going. And finally, this is Mushu. He's an old dressage pony. I think he just turned 19, but we're just going to say 18 for funsies. His only job right now is to entertain the five-year-old who gives him a crap ton of treats. So yeah, that's all the pets. Unless you're talking about fish, I have a couple fish tanks. They're a little dirty right now, and um, I need to clean the glass. So glad somebody bit on this comment because I've got a bone to pick about this horse. I've had Dallas for about a year and a half got her from a rescue I really love from a lady who I have known most of my life and who has been rescuing horses now for about 40-45 years. So because of this she knows what I like and for the most part I have to be like hey I'm looking for XYZ and she's pretty good at filling it. So when I went up to her and told her what I was looking for she had a few prospects open and my biggest thing was I told her I wanted a challenge because I've been training horses from the ground up since I was about 15 years old. So she picks up this horse for me. She said, this horse is going to give anyone problems, probably going to get somebody hurt. She kicks, she bites, she uh, rears up on people. Previous owner starved, beat, and tried to break her the old-fashioned way. But she has beautiful movement. And you know, she was absolutely correct about the beautiful movement. Gorgeous mover. Very, very nice movement. So me being about three, four months pregnant, I just do groundwork for like six, seven months.
And I expect a rough, tough, rootin' kind of horse. I expect fire and passion. Something that is afraid of nothing and can jump anything. That ain't this horse. She brave, don't get me wrong. We had a dog run up on us once, and she nearly kicked the ever-living daylights out of that dog. She's never spooked under me. She's afraid of nothing. That's not the problem. The problem is, is she's lazy and boring. After six, seven months of groundwork and me recovering from my birth, I finally decide to throw a saddle on her. I'm gonna throw a saddle on her. I'm gonna ride her. I'm gonna start training her. This horse is boring. I'm talking this horse barely moves out. This horse has no go. She's a great little trail pony, but she lopes like a western horse. Her working trot is faster than her canter. And as you can see by how nosy she is, we've dealt with most of our behavioral problems of kicking, biting, and being a crazy loon. So yeah, a wild day for Dallas is five minutes on a lunge at a trot. She's just happy to mosey on her merry little way for the rest of her existence. I love her dearly, but a venting horse she does not make. You bred your rabbit, she had a false pregnancy, when should you rebreed her? In our barn, I have had rabbits give birth anywhere between day 30 and day 37. So if I breed a rabbit and she has a false pregnancy, I will try to rebreed her again at day 40. If your barn breeds sooner than that or your program breeds sooner than that, that is perfectly okay. But day 40 is kind of like that safe zone to make sure she isn't actually just taking her time having babies. So this is just a friendly reminder that if you're looking at getting into meat rabbits, please stay away from big chain stores as well as auctions. A lot of these places will sell you kits under the age of 8 weeks, by in most states is illegal. You're also going to have an extreme problem with getting kits to survive to maturity. Not only that, but you're going to be spending money on animals that probably won't make it to adulthood. Your attrition rate is going to be atrocious. Same with auctions. Instead of spending all of these time and resources looking into those kind of things, I implore you to instead talk to local breeders. Look at breeds you are actually interested in that will be beneficial to you. Spend slightly more money for not only better quality rabbits, but resources as well. Most breeders that I've talked to and bought from will keep contact with me for months and years after I have bought my rabbit. If I have any kind of questions or concerns, they're definitely willing to help me out. And they guarantee that their sock will have some sort of success. Success from the standpoint of they'll actually make it to breeding age. At the end of the day, make sure you're being very, very careful with the big box stores when it comes to rabbits. It's worth spending an extra 10 to $20 on animals that will actually be beneficial to you.